Howdy ho, Canada. How are you this fine day? We are calling on episode 12 of the A Travel Talk Show. Did you ever thunk it? Never in a million years. Nope. Isn't Definitely, that... Uh, COVID has brought a, brought a whole bunch of new stuff around. Innovation, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Bring the tourism together. Bring the tourism yeah. communities together. Bring the... Uh, we've got... We've had a... I, 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 we've, we've batted above the bar on our guests. I'll tell you right now. Yes. Yes. Right. So That's some pretty awesome people, you know, we know our public here and everyone that's joining us and you know, you love the little banter Colin and I have being the Canucks that we are, but we have a top notch uh, show today. So we're going to have to cut back on the banter and let the, uh, and let the professionals talk. So before we do that call, we're gonna do a little bit of housekeeping, okay? One thing, this is recorded live on Facebook and available at the end of the show. Please share, please tell everyone to, to explore Canada and staycations is the key word of the day. Following, we will be publishing an edited version on our Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, YouTube, Reddit. Then, Cherry on the Sunday, is we feature it on all our pro all the provinces and on the front page of our Canada website, which, by the way, is the largest privately operated website now at 18,000 pages. And we will also be featuring this broadcast on our number 23 ranked top 1,000 global travel blog. So we sort of know what we're talking about. We've been doing this for some time. And, uh, and that's sort of how we have. Now, this is an interactive show. Uh, sometimes we can fit in some questions. Sometimes we fit in the shutouts. So uh, don't be shy. Now we've looked at our analytics, and we can see that majority are you Canadians that have been watching because the show is being viewed. Once you add all the formats over thousands and thousands of times, so majority of you like to keep on the down low and keep quiet and just enjoy your entertainment because. We aim to be fun and entertaining because tourism is supposed to be fun and entertaining, no matter what situation we're in. We can and talk. Educational. We can talk serious, but man, let's not forget how to live, right? And educational. Yes, very educational. So if you haven't know, if you have, if you were a newbie out there on this hit talk show, my name is Greg Gerard. I am the co-founder of AcanaTravel.com. Uh, we're ranked as a number 23rd top 1,000 global travel blogger around the world by Global Rise 2020. We're also a small town community consultant and a very excitable and talkable public speaker. And now to the smarter and better looking part of this show, you're on call. That'll be me, live. I'm co-owner also of AcanaTravel.com, seeing as there's two of us. Co-host of uh, this awesome and uh the tech of this operation and happy to be here the brothers of tourism that's what everyone seems to be calling us now a little bit out there i sort of like that ring the brothers of tourism we broadcast live every tuesday at 7 p.m pst right on this channel we have guests from all around the world travel experts strategists influencers corporations ceo aviation experts we've had them all and wait till you see the lineup tonight it even gets better we are what we're going to call this today colin is double header tuesday because not only do we have one guest we have two guests so let me tell you a little bit about our guest call first off Please we welcome we welcome mp blake richards of the conservative party of canada Blake represents the riding of Banff, Airdrie, Alberta. Uh, Blake is a shadow minister for tourism and Western economic uh, diversification. He's also vice chair of the Procedure and House Affairs Committee, and he will be joining us on the show. Then we have <laughs> MP Dan Albus of the Conservative Party of Canada will be joining us. Dan represents the riding of Okanagan, Central Okanagan, Similkameen, and the Nicola, British Columbia. So Dan is a shadow minister for employment, workforce development, and disability inclusion. And Dan will be joining us on the show also. So it is Colin, a double and header Tuesday. An exciting show at that. Yep. A little empty. Great. 
We're throwing a little MP, yeah. a little MP into the mix. You know, corp, our corp, you know, corporate upstairs, the big people uh, yeah. are the ones that pay our big salaries and, and oh. this and this really expensive set that we got going on. They're <laughs> they're telling us to shut up and let the big boys speak. So yeah. I think what we should do is uh, invite these two very knowledgeable and uh, well-respected people who represent our country. Uh, and anyone who wears their flag on their shoulder is okay with me and you. So let's start the show as we're going to introduce our first guest. Uh, Blake joined us earlier today calling at 2 o'clock uh, due to his schedule. And we had the opportunity to have a nice half-hour discussion. So here we nice. go. Welcome, Blake Richards, yep. to the show. Welcome to Canada's hit talk show, A Travel Talk. And today... We're very happy to have with us MP Blake Richards from the riding of Banff and Airdrie. Welcome to the show, Blake. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, and also, just so you reminder, as we said in the introduction, Blake is the Shadow Minister for Tourism. So he's uh, he's been gracious enough to join us today. And as you know, tourism is our wheelhouse here at A Canada Travel. So, Blake. Uh, I've got a few questions for you, and uh, I'm really, our audience, and I know we've had some emails come in, are really interested to hear uh, how you, uh, your take on the tourism industry. As you all know, Blake, we've been uh, devastated over here in tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, we have clients selling houses, we have clients selling inventory, we have clients that aren't opening their doors. Um, it's, it's a scary situation. So we're very appreciative that you're on board here to allow us to ask you, ask you some questions since you're very closely tied to the uh, federal tourism industry. So Blake, um, on June 5th, the Tourism Ministry of Canada delivered a tourism recovery plan to the federal government. In this plan, they were asking the sector specific support. So they were asking for some sector, regional tourism, provincial tourism support. And in the quote, which I found a little bit a little bit shocking it said to ensure canada has a tourism industry post pandemic so i read this like do something or we're not going to have tourism period i thought it was a little bit a little bit over the edge so my question is covid has revealed some of the cracks in this tourism industry around the world not just here in canada this is a this is an international issue it is not it's also an opportunity is this not an opportunity to restructure maybe even redistribute the responsibilities of tourism. Some would say maybe even demonopolize the tourism industry to some extent to encourage working closer with innovators, entrepreneurs, um, us in the private sector that in a lot of ways we are, uh, the, 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 the government tourism is not very appreciative of what we're trying to do. It's very hard to work with them. And is this not an opportunity like we've done with the media, the corporations, seniors, homes, the police force, everyone's restructuring. This has taught us a lot of things. Um, what do you see tourism doing? Why, why is tourism not looking at some sort of restructuring process to be more efficient, to bring along more Canadians to help promote the industry? Well, let me, let me just answer that in a few, in a few parts because I th I'd like to just kind of address the, the situation we face generally first. I mean, you mentioned um, you know, the, the uh, communique that came from, uh, from Tourism Industry Association and, and, and you know, um, warning of, of some potentially pretty dire consequences if, if, if there's no action taken to help the industry. And, and I, I, I find it hard to imagine that we, wouldn't, we would come to a place in Canada where there wouldn't be a tourism industry at all. I mean, we've got some of the most beautiful uh, parts of the world here in Canada, so it, it's hard to imagine that. But it certainly is, is, is not that hard to imagine, unfortunately, the idea that maybe we have a tourism industry that uh, looks a lot different than it does now. And I think the question asks really that you're asking is really about is there opportunity in this to make that something different be a positive? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and, it, and it, it, it potentially could be. I, I will say, though, that I think, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're faced with a, a period of time here where things are going to be difficult for the tourism ministry. Um, you know, they already have been, of course. I mean, the, the, with COVID, you know, the industry was, was, was certainly first hit. And, and obviously hardest hit because of the fact that, you know, uh, it's unlike any other uh, type of business uh, when we're talking about a situation like this one. Like, you know, I've said many times, if you, if you take a barber shop or you take a, you know, a foot, uh, a shoe store or, you know, whatever, whatever you might want to pick as a retail business, um, you know, when things reopen, 
Uh, someone across the street comes in, gets a haircut. Guy down the road comes in for a pair of shoes. Uh, that all you know may not happen as quickly as we'd like, but it happens fairly quickly. With tourism, of course, you know there is a lot of lead time required, right? You know, marketing campaigns. Uh, you know, it, you know, you have to prepare for what what does it look like in the airports and, and be able to communicate that with people from other countries. Uh, so it so it can be incredibly uh, difficult and a lot more time, lead times required to get restarted. Uh, and that's why I think we're in for a, a prolonged uh, period of difficulty for the tourism industry over over and above anybody else. And you know, like probably almost two months ago now, the Prime Minister came out and said, you know, there will be something specific for tourism. And since then, uh, what we've seen is there's been a, a, a series of money uh, that's been announced for like regional development agencies to undertake some projects to kind of help with a little bit of marketing or a little bit of personal protective equipment or things like that, like which are nobody is going to say is a bad thing, but it certainly doesn't go anywhere near where we need to go to try and help support the industry through what's probably going to be a very difficult period of time until next May when the start of next year's tourism, you know, prime season starts up. Um, so I think the first part to the response here is that there needs to be a recognition at the government level that tourism is going to have to be viewed and treated very differently than many other parts of the economy because of that recognition that it's not like we start again tomorrow, we start again at full tilt, hopefully next May uh, at best. And so the, that's a reality that the government has to recognize and, 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 and put the programs in place or adjust the programs that exist to fit that. Uh, and also, I think the other thing that's required is the government needs to come out with cr like clear criteria on how the decisions will be made about when borders reopen, whether that be interprovincial borders or whether that be international borders, so that people can uh, plan ahead for those openings. And I'm not saying that the government has to announce tomorrow, here's the date that this border or that border opens. But if we have an understanding of what it will, what the criteria will be that will have that cause that to happen, then people can plan for that. So that's the first step. The second thing is, yeah, is there an opportunity to rethink how things are done? And, and one of the things you mentioned was the idea of, you know, is there, is there monopolies or near monopolies that could be, could, could be broken that would help to improve the tourism? And I mean, an example of that in my mind would be when it comes to uh, our airline industries. Uh, you know, we've got two, two carriers essentially in Canada and, and should we look at, do we want to open that up a little more broadly to other international carriers uh, to serve the domestic market? Because one of the challenges that we've always faced in Canada is the cost of air travel here. Now reality is because of how sparsely populated we are, we're, we're probably never going to be able to compete with places that are far more densely populated on the prices, but could we do, could we have that be a little bit better if there was more competition? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably we could. And, and if the cost comes down a little bit, I mean, Canada's on everybody's bucket list, right? Like yep. everybody wants to come and see Canada and for great reasons. I mean, we've from coast to coast to coast, we've got some of the most beautiful parts of the world, but uh, we got to make sure that we don't put up barriers to, and that can be visa requirements that can be cost. There's all kinds of things, but here's an example of maybe we need to be looking at some of those things and figuring out how do we bring some of those costs down? So that might be one of those ways that there, because I do think with COVID, there's a lot of negative impacts here, but there are going to be positive impacts throughout everything we do uh, and ways that we view things differently and realize that maybe we could have done better all along. Yeah. And this is no exception. So uh, I do think there is opportunity in this, but it's first going to require the government to recognize that we have to do some things differently at a government level for tourism than we are for other industries that are, that are very different. And if okay. we start with that starting point, then the industry itself can figure the rest out. And I'm very confident in that. Okay. Um, with the tourism industry, we all know how it is. Um, it's funded. Re re it goes federally. Re it goes federally, regional, provincial, community. So it's like a, a funnel, vertical funnel, on how the funding is distributed. And with the recent funding that's come out, it's gone through. In this case, Western Diversification. Uh, the funding group there, and then it's funded down into the regionals and into the communities. Uh, some of the our client our client base that that we have and the and the individual frontline tourism businesses their concerns is, is is they've been sitting here 
and they're they're getting uh, emails and they're getting CO letters. We're here for you. Here's our one eight hundred number. Here's the links to COVID. Here's operating safety protocols. But what they're really asking for is ideas. What they're really asking for is how do we get out of this? I think in the industry we all operate on summers. I agree with you. It's, uh, it's a if it's a three summer issue before we get respectable. I think this summer is going to be very tough. There's going to be a lot of fallout. Next summer is, I, I'm calling it a recovery summer because it's going to be the first real summer. And then the third summer, we might actually have to address the international market and where it's at and what, what's happening. So our, our concern is, is in fact, because of this, there's a close relationship between public and private. It's, it, and it tends to get hostile. And I, I don't under, we don't understand the reasoning for that when we're all trying to achieve the same goal. Uh, we have a very... Um, a very a very successful program that is producing triple digit increases in memberships, triple digit increases in search engine optimization, triple digit increases in social media followers, and it's for built for small urban centers. It takes out the staff issue, takes out the funding issue, takes out the time issue, and all they have to do is create the information, and then our team develops it. And we just launched it, did an 18 month pilot, and then COVID hit. And the numbers are still off the chart. We have four new content marketers come on during COVID. The numbers actually during COVID compared to last year are still increasing. So more people are using uh, the platform right now during COVID to plan staycations, to plan local marketing. So the thing is, is because we, I think one of the reasons we look at when we look at our, the white papers and the webinars internationally and with the tourism strategists that we bring on the show, and we have good contacts across like around the world is I think in Canada, one of the things that we're really, we're really thing is if we did have a solid private and public partnership with the same goal in mind, it would have made it a lot better because what, we're seeing and a white paper just came out of Harvard I think it was was saying that because there is no partnership what we're actually doing without actually knowing it is we're opening the doors for Airbnb booking.com trip advisors to manage our brand to scar the brand and not allowing and they're taking as you know 15 to 18 percent of every booking out of the country which used to go to our sports teams our sports fields events and all this so there's a lot of things there that we're trying to do. So my question is, how could how would the Conservative Party of Canada show their support to improve this public-private tourism relationship and maybe even start supporting the privates because they're the innovators. They're coming out with all these new programs. They're coming out with all these different type of technology. Um, how can the Conservative Party bond that, that, that relationship? Because it's not, not just with us. We are the largest privately operated, but there is thousands and thousands of people with all us little privates that we employ, but we're always having an uphill battle. So what would the conservatives do to, to, to build that relationship? Well, I think there's, I think there's two, there's two key words here. The first one is alignment. And the second one is communication. And it's with that communication that you get the alignment in the marketing. Um, and what, what I, when I, what I mean when I say that is uh, you, you identified correctly, like there's, there's, there's the federal level marketing campaigns that occur with Destination Canada. There's the provincial level, there's the DMO level, and then of course there's, there's, the, there's the, you know, the private operator. So there's sort of four parts in that marketing. Uh, and if they're not aligned, uh, then we, we're, not, we're not succeeding with our marketing to the degree that we should be and that we could be. Uh, and I think what, what I will, what I'll say is that I think you have to, someone has to show leadership in order to create that alignment and someone has to be able to start communicating better. And I think that that the, the place best position to do that is at the top, right? The federal level. Yeah. Uh, and I will say that when Destination Canada, when we were last in government, uh, you know, I was a part of the tourism file then in, in government and, uh, you know, Destination Canada, we put under new leadership. David Goldstein was the, was the person we put in, in charge of. And, and what that, what there, what happened there was that it really uh, changed the culture. I think at Destination Canada to a larger degree, uh, became less bureaucratic and more, uh, oriented towards, um, you know, uh, solutions and, and market driven processes and things like that. Uh, and I think the alignment did improve. Uh, from the perspective of, I don't believe that prior to that, that really there was even proper alignment from the fe uh, from the federal level to even the provincial level on these things. Yeah. Uh, but I do really believe that that's something that's that's 
greatly improved in the last, you know, six or eight years. Uh, and it started to improve somewhat at the, to bring that alignment down to the DMO level, at least for some of the bigger DMOs. But I think that the smaller DMOs still get left out of that to too much of a degree. And they're going to be the ones that are going to be hurting the most now. Uh, and, and then, you know, bringing that down to the private sector level to deal with individual operators and giving them an opportunity. So I, I think what, what we could do best here is to communicate down the line, the marketing campaigns and what the goals that are trying to be achieved there are, Mm -hmm. uh, get feedback on those and then figure out ways that we can include anyone who wants to be a part of those. That doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be funding for that, but it might, you know, it may, it may be in some cases that, that will mean that, but it will certainly mean that at the very least there is information communicated back and forth two way communication about what that marketing campaign is going to look like. And there's going to be opportunities provided for people to piggyback on that campaign at the very least so that everything's in alignment because the, the more there's a common message and a common theme, the better success we're going to have with those marketing campaigns. And as you say, the better chance we'll have of actually driving that, that business directly to those private operators, the small businesses that need that support. So I think, uh, you know, it's all about, about communication first and then alignment. Just a, a little uh, a segue off of that. If, if, if for instance, if a, a D- destination BC is going to get anywhere from 50 to 72 million when they peaked on their funding for a year, why is it so hard to put a very small percentage of funding into the private sector that promotes tourism? Why is it such, why is that such a problem when 50 million, not enough that they can't spare a little bit to help all the privates out there that are doing marketing? Cause there are some pretty powerful influencers out there uh, that have millions of followers um, inclu- and including there's websites like us that are well over a million of travelers. We help every year t- two, three million, four million, I think we're hitting. And why is it so hard for the, the, the funnel to put out programs that help the private tourism once. Um, not like us, I think we're gonna be fine. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other programs we do, but there's a lot of the privates now are gonna disappear. They're, yeah. they're gonna be done. Um, and so I'm just wondering, why is this such yeah. a, a tough decision? I, I don't really think it is, uh, or it shouldn't be anyway. Um, and, I, and I mean, I would, I, I've said this for, for years now, uh, I think the way that this, this could look is, you know, especially where private, uh, you know, private, uh, you know, initiatives are putting uh, marketing funds in, could we not, could we not, to show recognition that they're putting that effort in themselves, could we not match that? Maybe that's a way of doing that. You have matching funds, yep. uh, which shows, you know, you've got some skin in the game, we'll come in and match and play alongside that. Okay. That might be the way to do that. So I, I don't think it's a difficult thing. I think it could be done. And, and I think it needs to be done, you know, as I say, with communication and, and proper alignment of those campaigns. But as long as that occurs, why couldn't that happen? I, I don't see any reason. Uh, and if, you know, if we say, you know, summers are going to, you know, and you're absolutely correct. Like this summer is, is we're pretty well, we've pretty well lost it. Yep. Uh, next summer, it, as you say, I think a good way of putting it, it's a recovery summer. There'll be some, some uh, return but it won't be a full, full, you know, a full return. And hopefully you're right. You're, you know, you're three, then it's a full return. Uh, so maybe in the meantime, we've got to be doing everything we can to encourage more Canadians to see other parts of their country uh, right. because that'll, that'll come back sooner than the international travel will, obviously. Uh, and also winter. Uh, we've got some great opportunities in winter in this country. Why aren't we promoting that more? Uh, that'll be the first opportunity people are going to have to travel again. Why, why would we not say, hey, guess what? There's some great experiences here in Canada in the winter. So I think if we, if we can align on those things, there's all kinds of opportunity here for us to, to uh, gain some pieces that we didn't have before. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it's a good point because winter tourism is, in, in our view, is, another, is our second peak tourism. And it is a industry or a sector of seasoning tourism that uh, many communities are begging for. Uh, this seems to be the winners of the winter tourism are the ski hills and maybe 100 kilometers around them that get benefit. Yep. Uh, but there's the rest of the country where, you know, we're not, I don't think we do a good enough job at our snowmobile industry. I don't think we do yeah. a good enough at cross country skiing, ice fishing. Those are great. Those are great examples. Those are, right. those are great examples. I mean, I, you know, I know that uh, many Canadians enjoy that stuff. 
but they maybe don't go very far to, to do it. They might just, you know, be in their own backyards. Um, yeah. And there's probably a lot of international visitors that would just love those opportunities if we gave them to them. Yeah. yeah. So. so if there's um, a Blake of many tours of markets, and this is, I, I got this from one of our resort marketers actually in your backyard there that I was talking to a couple weeks ago. Uh, many tours of markets rely on international travel, especially in Canada uh for for the revenues and then also for staffing um if we do not have our domestic tourism in place uh they're saying in september we'll lose about 60 percent of job loss in the tourism industry if we don't have it in place our domestic tourism and then according to the world travel tourism council uh that jumps up to almost 80 percent if we're if we're not settled in by the winter so the question here is if current Canada right now, based on, I think it was the UNWTO said, we run at about a 30% domestic tourism market in our, in our country. Um, while other countries like Australia have an 80% domestic tourism market. So what programs or partnerships are in place um, now? And what programs do you think the Conservative Party of Canada would propose to maybe put more emphasis on domestic tourism so we don't have this problem and it's not such a big climb um, because the next three years, that's all, that's what we, that's our bread and butter is domestic. Mm -hmm. Well, first I'd say, you know, when you talk about the kind of numbers that you just mentioned, and I don't this, I don't think they're inaccurate in any way, 60% loss of tourism jobs, mm -hmm. uh, being one of the largest employers in Canada, I think, you know, tourism employs about one out of every 10 people. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you're talking, if you're talking a 60% or more loss of, 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 jobs in the tourism industry, you're talking over a million people losing their jobs. Scary. So if there is, if there isn't, if there isn't already enough reason for the government to realize how important it is that we get this figured out, mm -hmm. uh, that should be a good, good reason right there. Uh, and I, I mean, we've already talked about it. Domestic tourism could be a big part of, of that solution mm -hmm. um and i think some of the things we've already talked about are some of the barriers and challenges that exist to it like you know i talked about competition in the airline industry and how that might drive down some some prices of, of airline uh costs at the end of the day let's face it um canadians i don't think they choose to to um not visit other parts of the country because they don't want to they choose to visit, not visit other parts of the country and, and instead choose a place like a, you know, an all-inclusive in Mexico or, you know, even uh, in some cases over to Europe because it's actually cheaper to do that than it is to go visit another part of the country. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And we, that's, that needs to change. So some of those things are long-term fixes, like you don't fix that overnight. Uh, but maybe in the interim, and I'm not proposing anything specific right right now, but I mean, the questions we need to ask are, is there things we need to do to create some incentives for Canadians to, to see the other parts of the country right now? Um, that might be a good question to be asking. Um, and on the long term, how do we reduce some of that cost that puts up the barrier to visit another part of Canada? Like, it shouldn't cost more to go from you know, Winnipeg to Halifax to see Nova Scotia, for example, uh, than it would to go from there to, you know, Cancun. Yeah. Have to stay there. So yeah. um, there's, there's a good starting point. Okay. So if just a little, again, a little uh, tag onto that, if, is it, is that, well, we did, we did a 10 year study. Uh, my brother and I where we went all across Canada. We visited over a thousand communities, 6,000. We, we studied the whole country for 10 years, sold the farm, sold everything. And we decided we wanted to, to promote tourism. And we went all the way from the Arctic ocean, Inuvik to St. John, everything. And here's one message that we, we came across the Eastern Canada has no idea about Western Canada and Western Canada has no idea of the tourism opportunities in Eastern Canada. So is it, is it really, is it coming down to maybe we, we really need to work on an education a process here to educate Canadians what's available or is it strictly they're not interested? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the fact that Canadians aren't interested. You know, I bring this up with people all the time and I, and I say, you know, have you ever been, you know, to, you know, and I'm obviously from Alberta, I'll say, have you ever been to the Maritimes, for example? And, you know, most people can say they haven't and they'll yeah. say, oh yeah, I'd like to someday, but well, man, that's expensive or, oh, you know, maybe I'll get around to it one day. So it's not that they're not interested. I think uh, there's a couple things. First of all, we've never really properly, I don't think we've ever really properly promoted uh, those opportunities domestically to yeah. other parts of the country. And hopefully the, that COVID will change that 
that's one thing that hopefully will come out of this as a positive. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think the other side of it is like uh, the cost again is, is, is a factor in that. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can figure those pieces out and perhaps that starts with, it, with, you know, looking at, is there ways we can incentivize that? And maybe it's simply just promoting it. I don't know, but, may, but maybe it requires more. So mm -hmm. I think those are the questions that we have to ask is how we do that. Because uh, there's far too few Canadians that can say like you can say, and like I actually have uh, can say now, uh, you know, I've had a chance to visit every, every province and, and uh, every, uh, every territory in this country. I bet you there's very few Canadians that can say that. Yep. Um, now I probably haven't had as extensive as you have, because some of those have been literally out for a day for meetings, but I can, I can still say I've been there and I've seen it and I've whetted my appetite enough that I'd like to go back and I will do that. Um, but that's the thing. We've got to whet people's appetite and, and, and I have no doubt that we'll be successful by, in doing that. Yeah. Um, here's, the, here's the million dollar question. This is the one that we're getting from our clientele. And, and we sort of touched on this too, Blake, is that many of us in the industry realize, you know, maybe our industry is maybe 70, 30 summer, winter tourism. And majority of the businesses out there are 98%, I think is the last number I read, are small to medium sized tourism businesses. And they rely on three to four months of revenues to pay for 12 months of bills. And it, it's, it's a concerning issue for many of them. So we are, now that we're beginning to sort of remove the travel restrictions or sort of going on this, entering this new tourism reality, because let's face it, the old playbook ain't going to work. We're going to need to rewrite a new playbook. Um, how does Canadians, Canadians are going to have to embrace staycations for us to get through this. They're going to have to venture out a little bit, spend their money, the ones that do have money. Um, will determine what communities and businesses are going to survive this whole COVID thing. So as a shadow minister of tourism um, for the Conservative Party of Canada, what is your advice for small and tra small medium travel tourism businesses right now that one, maybe can't access the $40,000, uh, the, the $40,000 available through the government, which again, a lot of them don't want to take on that debt load. They can't take on that debt load. It's a loan. It's not, it's not a fund. And if the second thing is you got your small business uh, employee benefits to help pay for their employees. But a lot of people in our business, our employees are in Australia. They're not even here yet. Um, so what, what would you suggest to these businesses that are out there? And they're sort of, there's a big chunk of them there that are in the middle that can't go either way. Well, it, um, honestly, I think uh, this comes down to like, I mean, it's difficult. I get it. Like this is, this is a challenging time. Uh, and you know, it's survival mode, right? Yeah. Let's, let's be honest about things. Yep, it's survival it mode and it's survival mode for, you know, a, a, a extended period of time. Uh, unfortunately, that's reality. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think that there are things the government can do that send signals that can help that, that extended period of time to be a little less extended. Uh, and so I think that I, uh, what I've advised a lot of people I've spoken to is you need to impress this upon the government. Uh, so it's, it's calling your local member of parliament and mm -hmm. saying, Hey, I'd like to sit down, uh, come to your, come in, in, in your office or your video meeting, I guess, if it's, that's, if that's more appropriate in the times, depending on you know, your province and where they're at with health restrictions. Um, but I'd like to chat with you about the challenges that my business faces. You can't talk about the tourism industry. You got to talk about the challenges your business is facing mm -hmm. and you can encourage other business owners to do the same. Uh, encourage your employees to do that too. Talk about their jobs. Because when a, when, a, when a politician hears about those impacts on a business or a person that's employed in their riding, it hits home and it becomes a reality. And if they hear it from 20, 30, 100 people, um, now they start to really sit up and take notice. And that's when you'll get them pushing their, uh, you know, uh, on people like the finance minister, or on people like the pr uh, prime minister or the tourism minister to, to, to take the measures that are needed, right? Um, so go and talk to them about the challenges that are faced to try and just survive so that there will be, uh, you know, as to, to go back to Tylock's point, so that there will be a tourism ministry left in this country to serve our guests when we get to the point where we're able to do that. Um, that's the best advice I can give. It, it, I know people say uh, one person can't make the difference, but actually it's only one person that can make the difference because if nobody ever steps up, then clearly there's not going to be a voice. Yeah. So if one person steps up and then one more person steps up and then one more, 
soon we have a hundred, we have 200. Um, now it, it's, it's something that gets noticed. And that's to me, um, you know, outside of, you know, trying to do everything you can to en encourage people to come and, and visit your businesses when, whether it's local, uh, from other parts of the country, um, uh, it's, if we want to really help to ensure a future, we've got to get the government on board too. Yeah. Well, and that brings up a, a really interesting point. Uh, one of the things we noticed when we did our 10 year study talking with, uh, a thousand communities, over 10,000 businesses. And, and, and this is a really interesting point. Their big beef is the programs available to them are built for urban centers. Mm -hmm. There's nothing out there for small communities. They don't have the staff, the skill, the time and everything out there. And the big thing they're saying is, yeah, we, we get it. We need to talk to our MP, but I don't have the skills to make an ad. I don't have the skills to do this. I don't have the time and I, I can't hire more staff. We're, we don't have the budget for more staff. So this beautiful, bright, shiny urban marketing tourism program platform doesn't cut it for us. So it might work in, in, in Toronto, might work in Vancouver, might work in Halifax, work in Banff, the ones that have that really good generation of revenue. But Small towns are, are in, a, in a tight spot here, and that's why we built our program. Um, but there's nothing else out there for them that they can yeah. access. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I think that is one of the challenges here is that things have been designed as, as unfortunately far too often it happens with government programs. They are sort of uh, forgetting about some of the smaller communities. And let's face it, a lot of the best tourism destinations yeah. uh, in our country are in those smaller markets. They're in yes. remote areas that, because that's where the beauty is. Yep. Uh, and so they are forgotten in that regard. Um, I think it's, it also extends uh, that sometimes it's uh, small businesses rather than large corporations. And you pointed out earlier, 98% of the businesses in tourism are small businesses. Mm -hmm. So we've got to structure things that work. So they work for small businesses, not just the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, those are two of the problems. And then I think even, even, you know, even beyond that, um, it's, it's also the recognition that seasonal industries can't be treated the same as, you know, a retail business that's open and, and serving people at the same level 365 days a year. Totally. So all three of those things are problems right now. And that, and I, and honestly, that's exactly why people need to reach out to their representatives because those, those three things are huge problems and mm -hmm. they all attack the tourism industry, unfortunately. Uh, and it's a perfect storm almost. So we have to impress upon our, our government officials that this needs to, you know, change. Yeah. We, have to, we have to recognize that reality. Okay. Well, Blake, it's been an honor and thank you for your time. Is there, uh, before we let you go, is there um, the best way for our audience to contact you mm -hmm. as their tourism shadow minister? What would be the best way? Well, uh, I would, I would tell people my website, blakerichards.ca has all of my contact information, phone number, email, social media links. Okay. Uh, but it also has, uh, I have a, a, a tourism newsletter that I keep in touch with people through and it's a okay. two-way communication. I'm usually asking for your feedback. So if you're interested in kind of being updated on what's happening, some of the, you know, getting your chance to have feedback into the things that are being brought to the government, yep. um, sign up for my tourism newsletter there as well. So that, that website at blakerichards.ca, you can do all of that there. Okay. So to our and followers. I'm always happy to hear from people and I'm, I mean, happy to try and do what I can to help in any instance where you've got issues with the government. So yeah. Uh oh, Look out. Oh, I know. I know. I just you must, have, you right must have a busy yeah. email box. Yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 can, it can be pretty full sometimes, yeah. Well, good on you for sticking up for tourism, Blake. We all appreciate it. Absolutely. And do you have anything, any closing remarks you'd like to leave with our Canadians and international uh, viewers? Anything you'd like to leave with them? Well, I'll, ju I'll just say uh, two things. First of all, you know, uh, to the people who are lis listening and watching that uh, – our potential visitors, whether they be coming from international points, uh, when we when when we have that ability to do that again, or whether it be Canadians that have thought maybe I'd like to visit another part of the country, uh, this is a good time to do it. Yep. you're going to have what's best about Canada is that we have these wide open spaces. We've got these beautiful landscapes, and this right now is the best time you'll ever have to enjoy those things. So take advantage of that. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is to the people who are our hardworking tourism operators out there, the people that are employed in, in our tourism ministry, um, you know, keep your chin up. Uh, this, I, I know it's, 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 it's easy to say and harder to do because it's a difficult time. And I know that, but you can keep your chin up because there are people, uh, myself included, who are out there fighting for you. 
Excellent. And uh, just for your viewers, A Canada is also one out there fighting for you. So there you go, Colin. Nice. Blake Richards, uh, the Shadow Cabinet Minister uh, for Tourism and Western Economic Diversification from the Conservative Party of Canada. So thank you, MP Blake Richards, for joining us. Yes, what a great talk. Yeah, lots of yeah. good information there. What about those hard, hard-hitting questions? Oh, yes, the host what? was tough. The host oh, was tough. I can, tell, I can see some sweat coming from his forehead. Sweat from my yeah, forehead, too, yeah. I'm telling you. Yeah. So our next guest is MP Dan Albus. He'll be joining us to talk on the show a little bit about federal, a little bit about BC, and a lot about Okanagan, Similkameen, and the Nicola, which is the writing that uh, Mr. MP Dan Albus represents. Dan is the shadow minister also for employment, workforce development, and disability. So this guy is, is the guy that represents us up at the big house. And mm -hmm. uh, let me just show everyone first a little bit here uh, before we bring Mr. Dan on. Uh, I want to show you our uh, background, uh, what we've done up. So courtesy oh. of Mr. Dan and Blake, we have now the provincial background of the Parliament building. In our well, that's Kingdom. impressive. Oh, yeah. Canada all the way, big budget. So Thank here you we gentlemen. go. Yes. So let's welcome Mr. Dan Elvis to the show very happy to have dan join us and here he comes one sec <clears throat> hey hey <laughs> dad <laughs> how you doing buddy that's the trade-off man Jeez, you guys are yeah. entrepreneurial Hey, we, we, you know, that's a, the that's a thing with our big budget here. Well, you know what? You make it work. That's what I'm yep. happy to see. Anyway, I love, by the way, the Canadian flags. So as you can see, I have one myself. And so, uh, yeah, looking yep. forward to today. Okay, Dan, this is the beautiful thing about live. So, Dan, here's, our, here's what we got. We're very happy to have you on board. Thank you for joining us. It means a lot. Uh, we have a lot of viewers here from the... Look at them. They're all laughing. They're having a big go. Way to go, guys. Right on. Okay. So, Dan, maybe uh, we've done our little intro for you. Uh, maybe you can give us, uh, our audience, a little snapshot into who is uh, Dan Albus. Well, uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, so, you know, I grew up in, and I was born in Victoria, uh, moved to the Okanagan when I was quite young, uh, went to school in Penticton. Uh, you know, it was quite, uh, you know, happy to, you know, to go to college. Uh, and then I got into entrepreneurship. And so I started my own martial arts studio and it was called Kick City Martial Arts. And so I uh, worked with youth and uh, with adults, uh, you know, trying to bring out their best. And, yep. uh, you know, eventually I joined the Chamber of Commerce and got really involved in policy discussions and advocacy. And so it was a natural step to move up to city council. So uh, you know, I was at city council in Penticton during a very tough time during the last, uh, you know, recession and, uh, found that, you know, I really enjoyed working on local politics. And when Mr. Day, Stockwell Day, my predecessor decided not to continue, I, I contested it. I'm very fortunate, uh, Greg, that I have the support of my spouse. Um, yeah. but you know what? I started from a small business, worked really hard to get it going. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be on your show tonight because I know that you're one of those persons uh, between you and, and Colin, where you bootstrap, you work hard, you bring people together, and you get people united around something. That's what's made this country great. And, uh, you know, sticking to those values is, is something, uh, you know, that hard work and sacrifice, working together, that's how we do things. Uh, I, you know what, Dan, I, I, I'm liking this Dan Albus guy more and more every day. Well, so, Dan, here's something I'd like to ask you. As you know, uh, we're all dealing with a lot of challenges here in, uh, in, uh, in BC and especially the Okanagan and the, and the Nicola Valley and the Similkameen area because tourism is, is a big part of our industry. So what are, are, what are some of the, the challenges that you see facing right now in, the, in this, I guess, it's sort of, I'm going to loosely use this term recovery because there's so many tentacles involved. Yeah. 
Um, what sort of process do you see in this recovery? Are you seeing in the in the Central Okanagan, uh, Similkameen, and uh, Nicola there area? Well, you know, first of all, let's say that everyone who's been running a small business has been running, uh, you know, uh, without a full dashboard. Many of us don't know what's going on and have been struggling, uh, just the same as everyone, uh, to deal with COVID-19. But, you know, whether it be in the Okanagan or the Similkameen or Nicola Valley, we do have some opportunities. You know, if you look at a town like a tourism center like a Soyuz, for example, well, they've been cut off from their border. Uh, and so people aren't driving across every day to, to go uh, in Lake Soyuz and en enjoy the sunshine. Or we're not like, uh, you know, some other tourism places. Uh, for example, uh, Vancouver, if you're, if you're uh, you know, near Richmond uh, or the airport, you're seeing a real drop in your uh, volume of, of visitors. Same with uh, if you're near a, uh, a cruise ship port. And so you've seen that business completely evaporate. Yeah. But in the Okanagan and the Nicola and, and Smilkameen Valleys, you know, we're close to everyone. We can appeal to, you know, we see gas prices low. Uh, and I think it's just letting people know that there are some really great activities to come out. Uh, fortunately, you know, it hasn't been a hard year in terms of fires, knock on wood. Yes. And, you know, that it would allow for, for people that when they want to, you know, when they have that COVID-19 cabin fever, uh, that they want to get out of their house and, and get out to the great outdoors, they're going to think the Nickel Valley. They're going to yeah. think about going and seeing some, some wineries in the Smilkameen Valley or coming out for peaches and beaches in the Okanagan. And so really it's about communicating that there's those opportunities um, you know, and this can be tough because you have some private campgrounds that, you know, are, are letting everyone, uh, provincial campgrounds, they're saying, no, we're not allowing Albertans, we're not uh, taking it out of uh, province reservations. So it's about communicating that A, we have uh, openings, B, that, that we have safe activities for people and uh, come out and join us. And so, uh, um, but it, it can be tough uh, depending on your situation. Now, as a country, um, you know, we have some provinces that are opening, uh, some that are still contracting quite a bit, uh, some that have certain rules uh, and certain industries that are opening up and, and yeah. some which, are, you know, aren't. And so it's a really challenging time to communicate that confidence to business. And the last thing we also want to see, Greg, is, is where, you know, uh, because this is, a, this is a pandemic, so ultimately, you know, health issues are economic issues and no one wants to see any of this second wave talk that we talked about. You know, we want we want to have a responsible opening of businesses. We want to see businesses be able to adapt to this new reality. And we want to see, uh, you know, business go on, uh, you know, because we can't stay in lockdown. Yeah, there, I, I totally agree. I mean, there's there's uh, there's a lot of dominoes falling as we're trying to make these decisions, uh, as you guys in Parliament are trying to uh, to push for these decisions, trying to open up a more freer speech, trying to get the everyone to get back and sitting and getting back to the business of the day. And, and I, and I get it. Um, there's a lot of businesses and a lot of our friends around this country right now that are, uh, are seriously looking like they'll never be opening again. Um, there, there's a lot of our friends in this industry right now that are, are setting themselves up to look for extra work. They're selling their houses, they're selling their inventory. It's not a pretty site. So, what we've been trying to do with our program is we're trying to bring the people in that are experts from around the world because the, the thing about tourism, it's not a Canada problem. This is a world problem. It's a global problem. And uh, there's, there's different ways that countries are opening up. Some are opening up with little safety protocols. Some aren't. So it's making a very, it's making our industry so complex and so tricky right now on how to move forward. So with with all this information that's coming out and how different countries are sort of, some are going rogue, some are working as a team, some are, some are saying basically we're going to do it the way we want to do it, I'll take the highway or whatever, is, is a real big problem to handle some sort of pandemic. But there are some stories that are coming out of it that are very, that are opportunities that are surfacing. Yes. Um, have you seen any uh, uh, positive opportunities come out of this? Have you seen uh, certain things in the industry that uh, if it wasn't for COVID, we might not be seeing? Well, again, again, I go back that uh, certain areas are going to have advantages uh, and opportunities that other ones won't. Again, you know, uh, for the Nicola Valley, you're very close to the to the lower mainland and to bring in some of that road traffic. And so the question is, you know, how do you get in front of those people and what's the value proposition you put in, in front of them? 
uh, because there's so much you can be doing. You could be doing horseback riding, you know, mountain biking, uh, hiking. And, and so it's, it's really kind of, you know, seeing, seeing the field and, uh, and making moves that only the Nicola Valley or Smilkameen or Okanagan Valley can do, uh, given the set of circumstances you have. Because, again, we, we have some of those advantages where we're not like the U.S. border and, and a Soyuz uh, or, uh, or uh, where you're uh, a community like, for example, Alaska, that is dependent on cruise ships. Yep. And so, you know, I, I feel really badly for those communities that are so tourism dependent. And, uh, you know, that's really where local uh, operators really need to communicate powerfully with elected officials and with their advocacy groups. So Chambers of Commerce, uh, Community Futures. Um, I know you're, you're, you're uh, well dialed into your local area as well as on utilizing your platform. And so that's where bringing these ideas together uh, is so important. And, and, and gentlemen like Blake Richards, who you had on earlier, well, you know, he's, he's seen, and see, seen these opportunities at a macro level and trying to present those opportunities to government because we want to see those good things employed right away. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's really what we're looking for here is, you know, what, where are you at uh, in terms of uh, your region and what are your opportunities and help us to communicate those. Okay, good, good. Um, as you uh, uh, slightly touched on with uh, with uh, Blake, uh, Mr. Mr. Blake Richards here was kindly enough to come on our show earlier, and how he's sort of looking at the ma the macro and the micro of the tourism industry. Dan, you're you're in that same position where you have the pulse on the employment and workforce development file on a federal level. So that's that's your go to right now. Um, when you're when you're representing us Canadians at in the Parliament, um, where do you see uh, us going as a country right now in that in your particular file? So we have we have two very separate challenges. You have where employers are trying to reopen, and so they're trying to get the the PPE that they need. They're trying to get the guidelines, and in some cases, like for example, those that are involved in the film industries. They need to be able to get insurance uh, because, again, COVID-19, I don't think anyone's ever filmed, uh, you know, under those conditions. And so they're trying to get those ducks in a row. And they're also trying to call employees back. And obviously, here in Canada, we have the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit, um, which has been absolutely critical for people, uh, you know, who, ha who just saw their incomes drop like a stone when COVID-19 and the original lockdown came in. But now we're starting to see where some parts of our economy, some provinces are opening up again. And so people are trying to get them back in. But people are concerned that they'll go over that $1,000 threshold um, where you, you're exempted if you, if you bring up to $1,000. But Greg, yep. at $1,001, it's all gone. You have to return that, uh, that $2,000 uh, benefit to government. And so on the flip side, you have these employees or would-be employees that also need to deal with daycare. They also need to, you know, that because uh, they may have, uh, you know, a situation where maybe they have a child who has a weak immune system or a parent that they're looking after who has a weakened immune system as well. So there's a lot of these, these individual situations. And so, you know, my job has been to really press the government to be clear and concise, to make sure that while they are, while they did roll out some of these programs in a rapid fashion, we obviously know that they didn't get it right the first time. Uh, when, when the CERB first came out, there was no $1,000 threshold. So, you know, it, it's, it's about listening to people. It's about matching the opportunities together and putting that flexibility into the program so that we get anyone who wants to work can. For those who can't work, they'll have supports and that backup. But also for those that want to, you know, you know help us to lead the recovery. Because I'll, I'll, I'll let you know, and I, you probably know this from your own, your own business, your own situation, is that, you know, the private sector has to take the lead. You know, the government can put some, some floor around the economy to say, look, we're going to be there to support you. But ultimately, the public sector cannot lead the private sector uh, into growth. It cannot do that. So, you know, government needs to be thinking about how do we support individual operators? How do we get people in yes. their own situations where they can work, they can produce uh, where those opportunities exist. Yes, and you won't have to convince me far on that one. Um, one of the things we heard, we had a, a real interesting from the, uh, uh, and I don't know if you caught the show, but we had a, a gentleman who's on the director of the board for the World Tourism Association of Culture and Heritage from the United Kingdom. 
phenomenal character, great, full of knowledge. Um, and one of the one of the interesting facets that that he said um, is he was really surprised at how the private sector has really stepped up in the tourism industry, where he was sort of. I think the word he was used was a little disappointed at how the the DMOs have reacted right now when with when he was comparing it and he wasn't talking about Canada or anything. he was saying on a global scale that this was a big issue out there is how and he was saying and he works on both sides of that fence and he said he was totally caught off guard at what the private sector has done to try and like shows like this like shows across that that, that have really came up because of COVID. We wanted to connect Canadians with the experts. We felt we had to throw ideas, get these people in online, get people to help other businesses share ideas, share their strategies from around the world. He said it's coming from the private sector. So what's up with the DMOs? Yeah. Well, see, this is the thing is, is that oftentimes these DMOs are created uh, because, you know, there needs to be, you know, a, a, an overall strategy for a country or a province or a region to be able to get its message across. And so oftentimes, you know, these organizations, they go to government and they put forward, you know, these plans and government ends up funding them. Now, those plans, you know, may or may not have been done in complete consultation with those people that are on the ground. And this is where I, my earlier point was, you know, if we're gonna see, you know, individual regions like the Nicola Valley, like uh, the Similkameen Valley, where there's opportunities, well, elected officials need to hear about them, and we need to make sure that those winning ideas are getting in front of government because, you know, oftentimes uh, DMOs, are, you know, are trying to operate where they're trying to please everyone. And when you try to please everyone, you know, the, the, Greg, you can't, you know, you, you, you don't please anyone. Um, yeah. So this is, this is the situation where there may be an opportunity for DMOs to be a little more entrepreneurial, to maybe shake things up. Uh, and when you have a crisis, that's where you want someone to say, is the status quo, is the way we've been acting appropriate? And, and is this what, what we're here to do? And so sometimes that re re requires, the mission requires you to change your approach uh, so that you can, you can fulfill your, your, your mission. And so, you know, that's what I hope that every DMO, whether they be in Great Britain or here in Canada is doing, is asking themselves, you know, are we, are we doing what it takes to achieve our mission? And uh, what do we need to change today to reflect the people we're supposed to serve? Um, I'm just going to put a little caveat on that. Um, I think one of the big things is if we would drop, and I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this, but if we drop the ego a bit, maybe we would have a really a lot more innovation, a lot more a lot more cooperation on that sort of thing. But again, that's just me. That's just hey, my saying. You know what I don't know if you ever read the Peter Principle. Yep. It's a fantastic book. And you know what? Uh, I've, I've run into the same issue in government many, many times, you, you know, even dealing with other people. It seems to be that if it's not someone's idea, then it's Yes. And, and, and so, you know what? So I, I hear what you're saying about ego, uh, you know, and, and sometimes we also have to say, okay, how do we get people on board? And one of the, uh, I think Dale Carnegie had said, is you want to make it, them think that it's their idea. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, you know, the old saying is, if you don't care who gets the credit, you can achieve a lot. I totally agree with that. I, I think that's brilliant. I mean, we're all here for one purpose is to grow small, small rural communities, get their tourism going, get some revenues happening, employ jobs. We're all on the same page. And, and I agree with that. So, Dan, why? Here's, that's a good segue into this part of the question is why in such a challenging time is there such a big disconnect between the tourism businesses and the resources and ideas and training? Because one thing we're hearing uh, when we talk to tourism across the country is, uh, and, I, and I touched this lightly with Blake, and I, and I like to throw it at you also, is um, they're tired of template letters. They're tired of my 1-800 number. We're here to, to help you. And they're really tired of seeing the same link on 80 different websites. Yes. Um, it's very easy to get a COVID link nowadays. Um, it's very easy to get safety protocol links. It's very easy to get operating and opening your new business links. They're all over the place, but they're getting really tired of it. And what they want is they want solid ideas. They want resources. This is an opportunity while they're in self-isolation to get skills training. This is an opportunity for them to look at different programs, different development, different platforms. This is what they, they want to be given all these ideas and then they want to be given the, let them make the choice on how they perceive. What they're saying is, Dan, we're not getting any ideas and there's no choices. 
Interesting. Well, you, you know, one of the challenges in government is you know, often don't want to commit major resources unless everyone's singing the same song. And if there's not broad consensus in a particular industry, for example, in the tourism industry, it, there's going to be a reluctance to put money down. And so what do they do? They, they go with the old faithfuls. Uh, you know, and, and quite honestly, you may have some really innovative, innovative ideas, but it's only being used by a small segment of that industry. And so, you know, from government's perspective, you know, if it goes horribly wrong and they've funded those things, it's, it's the expense of the tried and true. So, you know, this, this is really where you need to have both the innovation, but then a broad consensus. And that's the hardest thing to get in, in, in anything. Um, so, you know, this, this is where I think, uh, you know, government does need to uh, fund. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of pilot projects. Yes. Where, where you, you, you let industry take that lead and you also give them a little permission that they can fail. And, but the idea, though, is, is that if something is su successful, that you bring it back. And then you try it at a different stage. So maybe instead of just being a small area, now you go over a wider area. Because we always have to be evergreening government programs. The last thing I want is to have it where government's writing a check because it's the simplest way just to get people off their back. And no one's happy with that money. Yeah, no one wants it's not getting anyone any pickup. Yeah, and that and yeah, no one wants no one wants a free ride. Not anyone that's an entrepreneur. I mean, that's not in our blood. Free rides aren't aren't what we're in. We want we work for it. We we want to be creative and, and that sort. Um, before we let you go, Dan, what's the what's the best? I'm assuming that the best way to connect with you, if our constituents, our audience, um, if some of the people across our borders who watch this want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you, Dan? Yeah, best way is email, uh, dan.albus at parl.gc.ca or through my website. That's probably easier, danalbus.com. And that's spelled A-L-B as in Bob A-S. Uh, just click on the contact, uh, contact Dan, and it goes right to my cell phone. Excellent. And um, like we always want to do, Dan, is uh, would you like to leave, because uh, the, the, the stage is yours, would you like to leave any closing comments for our audience tonight? Anything, any words of wisdom? Well, I wouldn't say words of wisdom. I would just say words of encouragement. You said earlier that a lot of small businesses aren't going to come back. Listen, I've spoken to people that are near retirement age. Uh, one guy said, Dan, I haven't made a dime in five years. He says, I was just hoping I could get through the last recession and then move forward and then make some money in this next one. He's closed his business. So there are going to be, uh, I think, some real challenges ahead. And we're going to be seeing some favorite local businesses close. And that's yep. very sad. Yep. On, on the other side, we also have a lot of people that are struggling and they're trying to make it work. So you know what? Support your local coffee shop, support your local hardware store, support your, just support local. Uh, and you know what? If there are things that can be seized in your, in your area, so the Nicola Valley, Samil Camino, Okanagan, or, or right across this great country, tell someone what you want to see. Talk to your member of parliament. Talk to your mayor. Talk to your MLA. Um, you know why? Because quite honestly... Um, you know, we're going to be up to some tough decision points ahead and we yep. need to hear from you. We need to know what things you support uh, and what things you don't. And uh, all I would simply say, this country uh, was great and it wasn't great, uh, you know, by accident. We all work together, hard work and sacrifice. That's the winning ticket, I think. You know, if we work together, if we listen, if we're fair and practical with one another, you know, we can take on this challenge too. Excellent. Well, Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on our show and also to your uh, federal parliamentarian, uh, MP Blake uh, Richards, for coming on board. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I realize that your time is extremely valuable, so I really appreciate it. And hopefully we can have you back on the show a little down as everything starts to pale out and give us an update. Uh, but thank you very much, Dan. Hi, Air 5, Dan, physical Air five, distancing. Yeah. Air Thanks 5. Thanks for doing, Colin, and I appreciate hey. you guys all the hard work. Keep it up, eh? Hey, you got her, Dan. Thank I'm you. Craig Take care. Now. How come you can, How come I can hear you? We can hear each other. Just Dan can hear us. Ah. I'm in the power position now. This is like a, Oh, a my great. God. God, what's going yeah. on? I mean, Greg Gerard there and everything. 
Wow, you're way better looking than the real Greg Gerard. Yeah, it better sound yes. better too. Was, yes. Yeah. So quickly, uh, thank you very much to MP Dan Albus uh, representing the Central Okanagan, Similkameen, and the Nicola Valley area, and also doubly thank you again to the other MP who started off at the beginning of the show, Mr. Blake Richards, uh, representing the riding of Banff and Airgy. Thank you both yes. to you gentlemen for your insight, your knowledge, your support, and your expertise. Next week, we have Amber Papal will be joining us next week on July 30th at 7 p.m. PST. She is the president of Keystone Strategies, and she's also a board uh, on the board of directors for the Canadian Society of Association of Executives. So Amber will be joining us next week. And a little side note, please, we have a national candidate online, uh, two to three hours maybe by the looks of things, online show. We have artists from all over Canada and North America coming online. And it is going to be the most coolest Canada Day show you've ever seen online. Forget <laughs> the TV one. Don't watch it. No, come here. This is where it's going to be fun. So come on and celebrate Canada. And we have some top-line artists. We have First Nations, Blues, Fiddlers, Country, cow, uh, country, First Nation, everything. We got every group, Blues, Fiddlers, even a flutist, I think. So we got all these interesting and very uh, high profile artists coming and we're going to have a sing along for a couple hours celebrating our beautiful country and we wish that you all will come on board. Um, a Canada Travel, this is brought to you by acanadatravel.com, live, as you probably have all noticed, this is live, we love it that way, um, entrepreneurs think on their feet, they move on their feet, they think fast, and this is why we love this platform. Um, we are a 100% Canadian company, and we are your staycation specialists. Travel lots, travel close, travel safely, and support your communities because we do need you and when you are planning travel in this beautiful country of ours please support acanadatravel.com we are 100 percent canadian and we'd love your support and spread the word colin you got anything to close off before we say bye bye to this great group of people thanks everyone for coming out we love you all appreciate it excellent great so show. uh thanks dad hey everybody take care high five see you next week bye everybody